Anybody have questions? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a good time for questions. Yeah. I think I got a good one for you, uh, Steve. Yeah. Just fire away at you. Uh, what was it like uh, uh, researching your book for uh, five years and on that note, uh, what's your take on uh, uh, autistic rock star Temple Grandin? Ah. Um, <laughs> what was it like? Uh, very difficult, I have to say. I was working 80 hours a week for five years. I was getting up three, and three or four in the morning, uh, often would not leave my desk until 11 at night. You know, I had meals. <laughs> um, it was the hardest thing I've ever done. It was like climbing a mountain. Um, it was unbelievably hard. I had many moments of despondency, if that's a word, I think. Um, I would wake up with panic attacks at night. I mean, I don't want to whine, you know, because I did it. But, oh my God, it was hard. Plus my, uh, you know, like my medical conditions basically like declined in that five years. And so, because um, I couldn't really like see doctors much actually, you know. So um, it was rough. I mean, I think my husband was worried for me. Um, plus it was so stressful. I mean, it's like spend a month reading about the Holocaust if you want to cheer up. You know, it's like, it, it, was, it was really difficult. Um, and in fact, I will admit that about halfway through, one of the motivations to finish the book was so that no one would ever have to do it again. <laughs> you know, basically like, I had made it that far, like, I didn't want anyone to ever, I felt like I was crawling through the intestine of autism history, basically, like, I didn't want anybody to ever have to read those papers again. My God, you know. Wrote to me one day. Yeah. This is a couple of years ago. I said, yeah. Have patience, Janet. I'm doing yeah. it so you never have to. Right. Exa <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And so that's a good thing. You know, I feel like I, I did make it easier for people. And plus, I have all the source papers in both the notes and the online bibliography on my website, stevesolderman.com. Um, so you can download the bibliography. But um, and also the reason why I took why I have so many notes and long bibliography, is so that. People couldn't say I was just making it up, you know. In fact, one of the amusing things in some of the, you know, one-star Amazon reviews, he has no data. Really? Have you looked at the, you know, the 35 pages at the end of the book? You so know? you do read the comments. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, Amazon reviews, Amazon reviews I read. It's true. Um, yeah. Right. So, uh, yeah, anyway. Um, okay. And the Temple Grandin. Oh, Temple Grandin. Um, here's the thing. It's kind of trendy to like dismiss Temple Grandin now as like she's a cliche or a stereotype or something. I have hung out with Temple Grandin. I love Temple Grandin. She's awesome. She was very brave. She was one of the first autistic people to come out, um, autistic adults, when she, not, not necessarily the only, but one of the first. And um, she's quirky. She, I love her cowboy shirts. Um, the first time that I met her, I, I totally messed up, which was, it's kind of hilarious. Um, it was, uh, I was in a hotel and we were about to both keynote this thing and I saw her checking in. So I like, I like come up behind her and I'm like, Temple, hi! You know, <laughs> she, she, she just like walked past me like, you know, like, and I thought, Steve, what have you learned in the last few years? Like, don't do that, you know? And so actually, like, about 45 minutes later, I was introduced to her by a mutual friend, and she was like, you wrote Geek Syndrome. You know, yes, I did. Um, and so she was expecting it, and it was all cool. She was very friendly. She gave me her card. I interviewed her for the book. So um, I am not on the Bash Temple Grandin bandwagon. I am a Temple Grandin booster. Um, you know, has she said things that I don't agree with? Yes, she has. Um, has her mother said things I don't agree with? Yes, she has. But her mother was also a very, very brave person and, you know, really kept, temp kept Temple out of institutions. And so it's like, here's the thing. It's very easy for young radicals to dismiss the contributions of their elders. Like to young gay people now, the gay guys who came out in the 50s might seem timid. 
no, no, no. You know, they were very brave. And Temple Grandin was very brave too. So that's what I think of Temple you know, Grandin. What's fascinating about Temple Grandin for us too is that if you look at like YouTube videos of her, her earliest speeches and, and look at it through the years, she gets, she's, she's becoming a better and better speaker. So she's still learning. Yeah, exactly. I mean, she's still learning and still growing. And that's really great to see. Absolutely. And that's something I've heard from John L. Elder Robeson as well, the author of Look Me in the Eye and other books. And I've heard that they talk about this to each other, John and Temple, which is that they both feel like they've been through a big sort of skill set growth spurt in middle age. That they feel like in a way they're, they're, you know, they're really kicking in in, in middle age. And that's inspiring. Yeah. I'm in middle, you know, God, yeah. you know, so yeah. We have a question here. Yeah. Something you said earlier about um, people who self-diagnose it, and for the most part that we should respect that, um, and then just now talking about Temple Grandin coming out, um, makes me think of autism and Asperger's as an identity. Mm -hmm. And the two pieces of that are the kind of when you say, talk about hating the autism, that if an autism is an integral part of someone's identity, then that gets read as hatred of the self. Right. And then my question coming out of that is um, with the DSM shift, um, I know in my personal community that involves many people on the spectrum, that there's some resistance to this term shift because Aspie is definitely an identity exactly. um, and a community mm -hmm. and something that people, um, people like to call themselves and associate with. And um, just wondering if you came across that. All time, yeah, huge. I mean, the thing that I say, like people often ask me like, well, what do you think of the DSM where they got rid of the term Asperger syndrome? Here's the thing. A very honest psychiatrist once said to me, the DSM is not really about diagnosis. It's about reimbursement. <laughs> and, you know, I think that's true. <laughs> if, if, it's, if it unlocks services to fold Asperger's syndrome into the autism spectrum disorder, if it streamlines the bloody bureaucracy that every parent in this room, I'm sure, has been tortured by negotiating, um, then I'm, I'm not against it. But... I completely understand that uh, being an Aspie is a very powerful cultural identity. I think some people took it a little too far with the Aspie supremacy movement, where it's like they didn't want to be associated with those, you know, diaper wearing, you know, whatever. Um, that's just ableism, you know, in a different form. But um, I don't think Aspie supremacy really is still going on much. Um, and, uh, you know, so I think it's a, not only a, a, a worthy thing, but it's also, like, so su surprising in such an interesting way. Imagine if you could tell Hans Asperger, do you know that people will be calling themselves Aspies proudly? Like, I'm sure he'd be the most surprised, you know, of anybody. Um, and another thing, I have this quote in my book. Hans Asperger was very prescient even, like, into the 70s. Because he said that um, autistic people who value their freedom would resist ABA, which I thought was pretty interesting. Because mm -hmm. um, certainly, you know, yeah, anyway. Can you explain ABA? Oh, yeah. Applied behavior analysis. So it's, it's uh, and I'm not going to make any blackened statements, you know, because I know many parents who have found ABA. You, humane forms of ABA useful for their children. It's discrete, well, actually, I'm the least authoritative person in the room. Would someone like to explain? Um, ABA means Applied Behavioral Analysis. It was developed by Ivar Lovas based on the principles of Skinner, and it essentially teaches um, using something called discrete trial training. Um, it tries to condition people to have specific responses and to get used to, to specific conditions. So what, and I'm not doing a great job, so I apologize. But dis discrete trial training essentially means that you um, take data on somebody doing repetitive tasks or, or therapy actions many times in a row. So for instance, and I will admit here freely that my son has been in uh, ABA therapy since he was two and a half and I am reconsidering 
everything involved with it. So um, anyhow, um, so what they would do is they would sit him at a table, although not always at a table, and they would have him do things like um, uh, stack blocks in a tower, like 10 times in a row. And then they would take data on how many times he successfully did that. And um, I will say that uh, a lot of the controversy has to do with the fact that, oh God, I'm on camera, okay. Um, <laughs> sorry, I didn't know the camera was there. Um, ha Thank you, baby. Um, uh, now I lost my train of thought, I'm sorry. I'm stacking not on, blocks, stacking, stacking blocks. blocks. Okay, a lot of the problems has to do with, um, and the controversy is because there are some things that are easily taught through repetitive actions. There are a lot of things that you practice them, you get them, but um, a lot of autistic people agree with the quote that you said earlier in that it conditions them to go against their natural way of being and conditions them to be compliant. And you know, um, people who know my son can vouch for the fact that he's the most polite child you'll ever meet. And I wonder if that is his innate nature, which I hope it is, but part of me wonders if that's conditioning. You know, and so there are a lot of, lot, of, um, a lot of problems with it, and there are actually studies coming out that actually say that, too, that actually data saying that too much repetition actually impedes autistic learning. Right. So, mm -hmm. is, yeah. is that enough? Yeah. A lot of ABA okay. in the early days was directed towards, I, um, sorry. Oh, I just um, wanted to say that this is uh, Shannon DeRosa, and she is the author of Thinking Person's Guide to Autism. <laughs> One of them, the co-author. And I believe you will have read about her in Steve's book. And it's, her son is, is um, now I forgot his name. Leo. Leo. I thought I would never forget his name. With the, I just think green straws is all I can think of. <laughs> so anyway, thank you for that. That was wonderful, wonderful explanation. I will say we didn't do that with Ian, our son. We really, um, there's something about repetition, repetition that just didn't feel right. And the hours that they were at that time, the people who were advising us in terms of Ian was that, oh, you know, you have to do this 40 hours a week. And I was like, you've got to be kidding. He's a kid. He ought to be playing in the dirt, which is what he did.